Tom Fats. Gesundheit. Too kitschy. It does not mean bumpkins. Oh, what a mensch. He takes a lot of chutzpah. I just want to squeeze that little tuckus. Jerry, don't be a schmuck. Nudge. Klutz. Fats. I think I've been pretty clear up to this point. I want the whole Megilla. He wants the whole Megilla. Oi vey! Oi vey! Oi vey! Oi vey! Like up the mountain or down the mountain? It was flat. It was flat. It was a flat schlub. Mazel tov, brother. Mazel tov. <gasps> I'm getting a little verklempt. Hi, everybody, and welcome. My name is Lexi LeBan. I'm the executive director of the Jewish Film Institute, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our light lunch and not-so-light conversation at the 2019 Sundance Film Festival. Welcome, everyone. I'd also like to welcome everybody tuning into the live stream in the Bay Area and beyond. We're really honored to be streaming this off of our Facebook page. This is uh, the Jewish Film Institute's first year as a Sundance partner, and we are thrilled to be hosting this event today. A big thank you to the amazing Sundance staff and to the folks at the Kimball Arts Center for providing this really lovely space for us today. And thank you all so much for joining us. Before we start our program, I would like to introduce some of the people who are here with us today and let you know a little bit about the Jewish Film Institute. First, we have with us the Jewish Film Institute's program director, Jay Rosenblatt. Jay, can you wave your hand? Oh, there you are. Um, Jay is also an award-winning filmmaker who has had many of his films here at the Sundance Film Festival, so talk to him after the show. Um, we also have board members with us today, Susan Mall and Ben Berkowitz. Okay, good to see you guys. You can find them in the schmoozing over dessert part of the program if you'd like to learn more about JFI. So uh, for those of you who don't know, the Jewish Film Institute is based in San Francisco in the Bay Area, and we're dedicated to increasing understanding of Jewish culture, experience, life, and thought through the powerful medium of film, media, and dialogue. We believe deeply in the power of film and the stories that filmmakers create to help us all make sense of our world. JFI is celebrating our 40th anniversary in 2020, and we have a wide range of programs that celebrate the diversity of Jewish experience, identity, and expression. First and foremost, the Jewish Film Institute presents the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival, which was the very first Jewish film festival in the world and is still the largest, every year with an audience of about 40,000 in the Bay Area. And it's lovingly re referred to as the Bay Area's Secular Synagogue and is the largest Jewish cultural event in Northern California. We also host a variety of year-round screenings, including a Winterfest coming up February 16th and 17th, and community screenings in senior residences and at San Quentin Prison. If you are not from the Bay Area, you can enjoy our online streaming platform, JFI On Demand. We have curated over 1,800 independent Jewish films over the course of our history, and 350 titles are available for streaming on our website. And if you sign up for our newsletter at jfi.org, Org. We'll send you a free online short film every month, and they're delightful. Finally, JFI supports filmmakers working with Jewish themes. How many filmmakers do we have with us here today? Okay, quite a few. Welcome. It's good to see you guys here. Um, 
we support filmmakers through a, a Jewish filmmaker in residency program in our building at 9th Street in San Francisco, the 9th Street Independent Film Center. Uh, through a Jerusalem film workshop for emerging documentary filmmakers and through a, a robust festival awards program. Last year, JFI's San Francisco Jewish Film F Festival became an Academy Award qualifying festival in the short documentary category. So for all of you filmmakers out there, if you enter your short film and screen at JFI and win the best short documentary, you're eligible for an Oscar. Very exciting. And then relevant to today's program, we give a Freedom of Expression Award every year. And recent recipients include both Kirk Douglas and Lee Grant, who both stood up for freedom of expression during the McCarthy era. So if you're a filmmaker and you're interested in um, submitting to our festival, please find Jay after the program and or find us on Without a Box. And just remember, you don't have to be Jewish to join our programs. And we define Jewish film very broadly. It can be obviously Jewish content, or it can be, as we like to say, Jewish. <laughs> and now on to today's program. Sundance has a plethora of Jewish content films this year. It's what I'm referring to as the good, the bad, and the ugly. We have Dr. Ruth and Leonard Cohen. We have Harvey Weinstein, and of course, the subject of today's conversation, Roy Cohn, and I'll let you decide who's the good, the bad, and the ugly. We are honored to have Caroline Labresco with us, senior programmer at Sundance today. She is not only a powerful voice in the film world, but she spent many years as a programmer at the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival. So it's wonderful to be collaborating with her on this program today. And she will be interviewing Matt Tiernauer, the director of one of the most provocative Jewish titles in the lineup. We are th so thrilled to be celebrating his world premiere of his film today. So please welcome to the stage, Caroline Labresco and Matt Tiernauer. Yes, my first job in film was working at the Jewish Film Festival as the associate director from 1993 to 1997. Interesting. Um, and what that taught me, which, was, which has served me so well, is that film has a lot of power to change how we see ourselves and how we see each other. It was that basic for me that made me catch a bug. That was the sort of the the philosophy behind the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival was about how can we use images to expand how we see Jews. Um, so we were very, and always you can carry on this tradition, we were so committed to uh, showing a range of images from North African Jews to Yemenite Jews, you know, beyond sort of the Ashkenaz bagel um, stereotype, right? Um, and that was really, really meaningful and something I've carried on in my work in the last 18 years here at the Sundance Film Festival. So, and it's my great pleasure, actually, when they asked me to, to be part of this, I said, can I just talk to Matt Tiernauer? Um, <laughs> because I admire Matt's work so much. Um, I've, I've, I admired him um, as a Vanity Fair writer um, and journalist, and I've admired all of his films so much. Um, he is kind of unflinching in his willingness to look at, actually, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the, the magnetic and the monstrous together, I think. Um, his films include uh, Valentino, the film about Valentino, Emperor, The Last Emperor. The Last Emperor. The Last Emperor. Um, the, his recent film, Scotty, about Scotty and Hollywood, um, that came out this year at the Toronto Film Festival, or last, was that last year? 2017, no. sorry, the year, you know how the years start to merged together. Um, his film on Jane Jacobs, the warrior who tried to defend um, public housing and, and the citizens of New York City. Um, effectively, he has been making a film a year for the last four or five years. It's incredible. It's an incredible output. And I know you have an incredible team that you work with as well. Yeah, well, that's the, uh, <laughs> as, as 
not to hijack your intro. As no, journalists, please do. Journalism's the loneliest job in the world. Writing's the loneliest job in the world, and filmmaking's the least lonely job in the world. It's the most collaborative, and uh, that's always the first thing I love about it. And uh, I, my producing partner Corey Reeser is here today in the front row. Corey so Reeser, yeah, here he is. Um, but they, together as a team, their their output is is quite extraordinary. It is no small feat to make a film a year. I'm in awe. Um, and I, I, I'm very proud because I, the Sundance Institute had a, had a part to play in this film, Where's My Roy Cohn? We, um, we brought it to a program that I run here at the Institute called Catalyst, Sundance Catalyst, um, which brings together investment with exciting new projects. And so we were really thrilled and lucky to bring this project um, and to connect Corey and Matt with a bunch of new, hopefully, I think, new partners. Um. Yeah, it's no exaggeration to say um, that this film would not be coming out now if it weren't for Catalyst and Caroline uh, because we got a running start on the funding at Catalyst uh, two Catalysts ago, I guess, right? Yeah. And uh, we did... Um, we did very well there. I hate saying that phrase because Trump always says we did very well. well we did so very I well. Stopped when I was saying it. But anyway, it it was a great uh, experience for us. And this film wouldn't be possible without Caroline and Catalyst. So, thanks for kudos that. Kudos to that. But we and even more, we're so proud that to premiere this film at our festival. And as you all know, the world premiere happens right after this conversation. So I prepared um, a bunch of probing questions for Matt. Um, and then, so I'll run through some of those and then we'll open it up to a conversation with this with this room. Um, so, great. So I think I'll just launch in. Launch. Let's launch. Okay, so it's so interesting because I think we're all kind of aware that Roy Cohn, it's his moment right now, again. I mean, I think we all became aware of him anew when, you know, in the 90s, when Angels in America made its incredible splash during the height of the AIDS era. Personally, my mother was obsessed with the Rosenbergs. Um, she was a left-wing, you know, red diaper baby who was obsessed with Roy. So I knew the name Roy Cohn growing up. But, um, and then that was reinforced in the early 90s with, as I said, with Angels in America. But now, here we are again. And it, we, Trump is in office. We... Uh, Angels in America is about to open again on Broadway. When is it opening? Um, it did already. It just did. Um, and and your film, your film is here. So what an, what a fascinating moment. Tell us about. Are you prescient? <laughs> what um, what led you to this project? Tell us that story. I started making this movie the day after the election of 2016. Uh, it happened that the film previous to this was about Studio 54, and Roy Cohn was the lawyer for the founders of Studio 54, Ian Schrager and Steve Rubell. So in the edit room for uh, most of that election year, I was watching Roy Cohn defend uh, Rubell and Schrager against uh, something that they were enormously guilty of, which was tax evasion and a lot of other bad things that they went to prison for. Uh, Roy was their lawyer, and he uh, actually is one of the few cases he really seriously botched. Uh, but Cohn was on all this archival leaping off the screen, and I'm, I'm thinking, well, this is an extraordinary character. Where's the Roy Cohn documentary? But then I kept thinking to myself, well, Roy Cohn's not relevant. Uh, Donald Trump won't win the presidency, and we'll never have to hear from Roy Cohn or Donald Trump again. So on the shocking day of the election, uh, that night, uh, I remember watching it and sitting in a hotel room and compulsively eating an ice cream sundae in my neuroses uh, and drinking the bottle. I was in a hotel. I had a bottle of gift wine and a Shake Shack was across the street. When they called it for Trump, I ran to Shake Shack and got, this is, shows you I'm Jewish, got an ice cream sundae. Totally, <laughs> totally get it. Self-medicated with that. And then I, I'm not a big drinker and I drank an entire bottle of red wine. And then the next day I went to the edit room for uh, Scotty in The Secret History of Hollywood and uh, Corey and the editor Bob Eisenhart were there because we could do no work but we got to talking about how a movie about Roy Cohn was now absolutely imperative and I wrote the treatment that evening uh, actually and then we got launched that way. Uh, uh, overall I would say I believe that Roy Cohn would have been a very bold footnote 
uh, to American history, except for the uh, surprise election result of 2016, where he now, uh, because of the advent of the Trump presidency, must be elevated and considered as a modern Machiavelli. And we have to consider that very carefully and deeply. And this film is designed and meant to provoke that uh, conversation. It is absolutely a key to understanding the code that Trump uses um, and the key to dismantling that, I think. Um, tell us about, so as you've, as you've watched the Trump presidency, have you been able to trace Cohn's tutelage throughout that, the last two years? Have Some you had greater insight into Trump? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, Donald Trump is Roy Cohn. Uh, he, he swallowed him whole. Uh, and Cohn, who died of complications of HIV AIDS in 86, uh, lives on uh, through his protege, his, uh, ironically, apprentice, Donald Trump. <laughs> Uh, he taught Trump everything he knows about uh, politics, certainly, and manipulation of the uh, press uh, and media industrial complex. And uh, Trump uh, absorbed this information, got it intuitively, and has used only the Roy Cohn playbook uh, ever since, and he wrote it all the way to the presidency. There are several moments in this film that are um, just in the raw archival very chilling, including an interview with Cohn that NBC News shot on film in 1978 and never aired, where uh, Nostradamus-like Roy Cohn predicts that Donald Trump will be president of the United States, 1978, when Donald Trump was a relative nobody. Uh, and he says, I'll paraphrase, uh, after he does this sort of weird, almost sexual elegy to Trump, holding a picture of him and s bragging that Trump calls him his best friend in the world. This is 1978. Why would anyone care to brag about Donald Trump being your best friend in 1978? He then goes on to say that Donald Trump is a meteor rising from New York, which will go on to touch every part of this nation and many nations around the world. Uh, he clearly saw Trump uh, as someone that could be president, and in his mad genius, and I think his lust for Trump. His lust, yeah, which we also see around McCarthy, in the people around McCarthy and, and Joseph McCarthy himself, I think. Specifically one person around Joseph yes. McCarthy, uh, who was a tall, blonde, all Jewish, although very Shagitz looking uh, Jew. Um, David Shine. David Shine. G. David Shine, who was a uh, scion of a hotel company, and uh, Roy was uh, deeply attracted to him. I would speculate sexually obsessed. Uh, and that's really his obsession with Shine brought on the Army McCarthy hearings. And the end of McCarthy. And, and then a domino effect led to the end of McCarthy and should have been the end of Roy Cohn, but Dracula-like, uh, he, he reemerged in New York City uh, and uh, as someone uh, brilliantly says in the film, actually it's Liz Smith, the late Liz Smith, says he couldn't get over McCarthy, Roy Cohn, so he just embraced it more. Yes. Sound like anyone uh, we know today. She also says he never gave up on his own myth. That's right, and then uh, Jim Zirin, uh, who's here today, uh, a lawyer, author, and scholar, says that uh, Cohn believed his own myth, and when you believe your own myth and keep on believing it, it contributes to the reality. Again, uh, you know, the, the old Mark Twain saw, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, it rhymes, uh, really applies here, and I think this movie is uh, a rhyming, uh, a rhyming poem uh, that is, I think, a very frightening one. And we get to see his, in a way, he's a great artist, the way he concocts his playbook and plays it again and again. And that playbook being, don't apologize, attack, never surrender, never admit defeat, even when you lose, declare victory, counterattack, hit them 10 times harder than they ever hit you, and then use the press. I mean, that's the playbook. 
uh, and uh, Trump has has been doing it. Uh, Twitter obviously didn't exist when Cohn was uh, at large, but uh, you know Trump's adaptation. I, I think that was probably the key to his attaining the presidency. Was I think he had one last moment in him where he could adapt and uh, figure out uh, Fox and the Hedgehog like uh, a key thing about the modern media. He had the print media and the local TV, national TV, Nexus Plexus, publishing industry. He had the codes to all of that, the nuclear codes to everything, and Cohen gave him those. He introduced him to the Newhouse family, the Hearst family, all of the media barons that uh, he had cultivated and, and manipulated, and Trump understood all that because he's an analog guy. That he got Twitter and you know the fox and the hedgehog, the, the fox knows many things, the hedgehog knows one thing, but it's one very big thing. I think that was his hedgehog moment that landed us in the, the predicament that we're in today. But also, I mean, there's so many extraordinary revelations in the film, which is a testament to Matt and his team's ability with storytelling, but also uncovering some really exciting mysteries and facts through their archival research. But one of them is that I believe Cohn also had his own relationship with Fox, right? His, he was part of that of masterminding uh, that. I would yeah. go so far as to say that he invented Fox News. Um, many people might differ with that. You'll see in the film, uh, Rupert Murdoch uh, was just entering into the, the bloodstream of American media in the 70s when uh, Cohen, of course, Zelig-like, uh, pops up at Rupert's side and starts escorting him around and introducing him to famous people because Roy Cohn in the 70s was the fixer and he had uh, the media manipulation, again, nuclear codes. He was the carrying the football of that, right? So a lot of things had to pass through him. Murdoch's trying to uh, dominate New York media at the time. He buys the New York Post. There was an FCC regulation at the time that said you couldn't own a TV outlet and a print outlet in the same city. The Reagan administration dispensed with that. Roy Cohn was the one who gave them that idea, and there is photographic evidence in the Oval Office of, um, and this is explained in the movie by Roger Stone, to whom we will, I think, arrive in a moment. Yes, uh, we shall. Uh, where um, Roy Cohn introduces Murdoch to Reagan while he's running for president. We have all the correspondence from Jim Baker and Charles Wick, who is head of, uh, of I think, uh, the media branch of the executive branch at that time, uh, begging for Rupert to be brought into the Oval Office to have a meeting with Reagan. It happened. Roy Cohn was sitting right next to them. There are 100 photos, and Roy gets up in the middle in this series of still photos and is, inserts himself between Reagan and Murdoch and appears to be saying, you shall dismantle this regulation and let Rupert have a TV station. And that really was the legacy of that meeting. It took uh, several years, and it happened. It's incredible. And some of those photos are in the film. And you, you're... Your mouth will be dropping open that all of, that yes, this Svengali, this Zelig is there at every turning point. Um, before we talk, I really want to talk about Cohn's psyche, but I want to, let's talk about Roger Stone because everyone's read the news today that he is indicted, that he is, he is a central figure in your film. You got an incredible interview with him. I want to ask you, how did you land that interview and how did he respond? And, and also the moral, his moral standing within the film. It's such an interesting dynamic between Gary, you know, who's, who's a reliable narrator in the film sitting right here, um, and Ken Auletta, you know, who we sort of trust in the film. And then Roger Stone is, is a key figure in the film as well in this dynamic between who can we trust um, to tell this story? Well, I love an unreliable narrator. Uh, yeah. So... <laughs> Roger Stone certainly is that. Uh, the um, the uh, Marie Brenner, who's a producer on the film and a colleague and old friend from Vanity Fair, uh, had the relationship with Roger. She'd interviewed him for her wonderful piece about Cohn uh, in Vanity Fair. And uh, she um, lassoed Roger into our studio, which was actually Marie's living room that day. Uh, and Marie and I, before we're having these panicked phone conversations, do you think he's going to drop a bug? Do you think Guccifer 2.0 is going to be listening in on all this? And we're still not quite sure whether or not that happened. Uh, but Roger arrived in his impeccable tailoring 
boomerang in his impeccable wig. Uh, and um, I was... Bulging muscles. Exa- we didn't see those mercifully. Uh, and we saw no tattoos <laughs> mercifully. Uh, and I was dreading this interview day. I thought, I, this is awful. Um, I, it's good for the film, but this is just going to be toxic and he's going to be terrible and we'll never use it. I was so crushed at the end of the day to find that he was so beyond brilliant on camera. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's a master of the interview. Everything he said was usable. His cadence was perfect. He gave a performance. He never even says an um or a but. I mean, he he never stalls. And he appears to be telling the truth. And I think at certain times he is telling the truth, but it's often like Trump, uh, where he tells the truth, strangely, even if it's incriminating. So he tells the truth to Lester Holt in his NBC News interview and says why he fired James Comey. And it seems to have been the truth. It might, it might get him impeached. But there's something um, raw about this. I think that Cohn did the same thing, but Cohn was a, a million times more intelligent than Trump and was much craftier and I think much more layered in his in, in strategic. Uh, but, uh, and, and Stone might be as well. I, I can't say that I think Trump is, but he takes that, let me put it to you and give you the, the raw truth and the skinny because it's, it's sexy and it gets you in the paper if you do that. So um, he does that, but I don't think Trump does it as strategically as Cohn, but you get in the film a, a triangle here. You get Roger Stone speaking for Roy in the film. You get Roy um, in spades all through the archival, and then you get the, uh, the funhouse mirror of Trump. Uh, and th- that reflection and that refraction uh, is the film, basically. But Trump refused to be interviewed? We asked him three or four different ways. Uh, I set up a fake email account uh, to ask Roger to ask Trump. (laughs) No reply. We sent a general press office query, and then we wrote to Sarah Sanders directly. And uh, we wrote to Trump directly as well, a letter to Trump, uh, and no reply. Isn't this so juicy, you guys? (laughs) So can we talk a little bit about, like, okay, so you've spent all this time with all this archival about, with, with you've spent all this time with Cone right. directly, maybe more than anyone else, possibly. Um, you know Cone so well. He's so full of contradictions. He is, I love this idea that he's the bridge between illegit- the illegitimate and the legitimate in American politics and society. Um, he is someone who, is friends with the Reagans, um, friends with the mafia. Um, he's an old boy in a way. At the same time, he's a flamboyant gay man um, who loves getting spray tans and loves being glamorous and has a mirror on this above his bed. How do you make sense of these contradictions? And did you find anything real in Cone, or is he truly always performing and there's no there there? Uh. I don't know if I made sense of them. I think the film, I, I like to leave it to the audience to make their own sense of things. Uh, that's really the technique. Uh, and I have conclusions uh, drawn, but the film basically lays out a case. And I think the audience, uh, it's designed for the audience to have their own takeaways. And it's designed for you to fight with each other when you leave the movie theater and go have dinner and argue, which is the great case for theatrical film and especially theatrical documentaries, I might add, is that you go in a, sit in a room with people, hear the oohs, ahs, gasps, laughs, cheers, whatever. Then you argue or talk or agree about it leaving the theater and go to dinner. This is going out of our society right now. and We have to get it back. So uh, this film is designed as a theatrical experience, and I hope you all have that with it and come to your own conclusions. Conclusions. Uh, when I, be- I had a moment, a dark personal moment, when we started embarking upon the project. I thought, oh my God, I've just signed up for a year plus of Roy Cohn in my life every day. It's going to be a Dostoevsky year. Uh, and I'll be like Raskolnikov um, talking to myself, uh, not wanting to go to work in the morning. Actually, pleasantly surprised. Nothing could have been further from the truth. There is something 
sprightly and magical about Roy Cohen. There's, he, he had, first of all, he had legions of friends and very unexpected ones. Uh, the, lo the limousine liberals of New York were devoted to Roy Cohn, even ones whose parents inculcated in them a hate of this was the person who killed Ju uh, Ethel Rosenberg, you know, the person. said, I would have pulled, if I could have pulled the lever, I would have. Well, yes, I'll, uh, Roger Stone says that in the film because I asked Roger Stone to digress for a second. Um, but I said to him, this is early on in the process, I said, Roy has blood on his hands. I mean, he's Shakespearean in this. Did he ever, at the end of his life, express remorse to you? And he said, I asked him about the Rosenbergs, and he said to me about Ethel, if I could have pulled the switch, I would have done it myself. And then Roger, in his perfect Oscar-worthy performance, says, that doesn't sound like remorse to me. There's a bit of Nixon in there as well, and all these, all these Chris Buckula, Chris, uh, all these, uh, these sort of creepy, um, worm-like figures in our politics uh, have Nixonian, McCarthy-like overlays to them. It's the paranoid style of politics, and it, it's a theme. It's they're all of a piece, and they're all layered. Uh, in our in our culture, and Roger expresses that because Roger Stone touches Nixon and Reagan and uh, Manafort and the whole um, creep industrial complex of our, our political system. I mean, he was a Republican fixer, but we and yet he we become we start to think he's ideology agnostic. We Roy Roy, I'm yeah. talking about Roy. Yeah. Um, he. Didn't, did he care about any of this? Or was it all about power and money? He, did did it, he have any beliefs? No. Uh, and that's where he and Trump allied. I mean, it's narcissistic personality disorder. It's borderline. It's all, everything that Trump is, he was. I think that he came by it, and this is where the Jew part might come in. Uh, he came by it through a particular... Uh, uh, admixture of life events and parentage that uh, was uh, unique and really extraordinary and quite fascinating uh, that created this monster, basically. Now, people call him and his friends, such as, again, another liberal line of New York, Jason Epstein, uh, one of the founders of the Village Voice and a pillar of liberal thinking and uh, New York Review of Books uh, founder, actually, uh, loved Roy Cohn and said he was a lovable monster. And people said to me, well, how did he survive McCarthy and go to New York and then um, thrive in New York society? And how was he taken in and, and propped up by New York society? To which my answer is, have you ever met New York society? I mean, it's the most transactional thing ever. And, uh, you know, Edith Wharton's transactional accounts of New York society are no different than they were in the 50s and 60s when Roy figured out how to own the town. The difference was between a Wartonian take on it and a Roy Cohn take, which happens post-war, is that a Jewish guy could actually get to the top then. Uh, the doors had opened. Uh, he came from, I'll digress briefly here to say, an astonishing array of um, Russian Jewish wealth. The, the top tier below the R crowd Jews were the Cohen Marcus uh, family. The, listen to the uh, corporations this family controlled uh, from the mid 20th century on down. Um, the Bank of the United States, which was the main Jewish bank. Lionel Trains, Van Heusen Shirts, which was the dominant shirt manufacturer for the middle class at the time, and um, Q-tips, uh, crazily enough. Uh, There's a joke in there somewhere, but I... I... Somewhere. Uh, so uh, Cohen comes from a very privileged cast, uh, but it wasn't the Our Crowd cast. It was the, uh, the uh, German, uh, sorry, it was the Russian uh, Middle European Jews, and there was a lot of Jewish on Jewish anti-Semitism in the period in New York. In fact, Kike as a slur is a German Jewish slur against the people whose last names began with ski or ended with ski. 
Uh, kike was a permutation of the ski suffix, and the German Jews would spit down on the uh, Middle European Jews. And it's out of this cauldron of uh, New York. Um, Self-hatred, basically. Could be, uh, but also trying to get ahead and um, a mixture of, uh, of real mixed feelings, uh, which also then the Holocaust and the Second World War uh, augments that Cohen has created. And he is a post-war manifestation of the the darkest parts of the Jewish psyche, I would say, um, just to hit a theme that we should be hitting here today, probably. Absolutely, and I think, and then his borderline and narcissism, um, kind of possibly brought about by his mother. Um, possibly. Um. <laughs> who, was, who was cold It's hearted. special. Um, I think Dora Marcus Cohn, um, Reminded me of from in a filmmaking um, frame. Uh, she reminded me a lot of the mothers in Alfred Hitchcock movies who manipulate their sons and make them closet homosexuals, uh, which was, by the way, always present. I mean, the fifties, the the fucked up fifties psychiatric uh, take on male sexuality and homosexuality was that it was the mother's fault. So if you thought you had a gay son as a Jewish mother, you were um, quite um, uh, perplexed and upset and um, looking to blame anyone else uh, but yourself for this, I think. And then it, it creates a feedback loop with, with the gay son. And Dora, I think, was uh, super special in her narcissism and her uh, sociopathic behavior. And um, there's a moment in the film, one of my favorites, where another cousin, um, uh, Gary Marcus, who's a, a cousin of Roy's, is here today. We alluded to him by the first name, Gary, earlier. Uh, another cousin, Ann Royfe, the first uh, wave feminist author, uh, who wrote a lot about Judaism in the city at the time. Anne is in the film and uh, brilliantly uh, <laughs> delivers a line when she's trying to explain who the mother of Roy Cohn, Doris, Dora Marcus was, and she says, Anne Royfe says, my mother always told me that Dora was the ugliest girl in the Bronx and that a lot of Dora's baggage came from the fact that she was a um, privileged daughter of the highest caste of Russian Jewish wealth, but she couldn't get married. And we're talking about the 20s here. So she didn't get married till she was how old? Do you remember, Gary? It, almost 40, I think. She was a late mother. It was a kind of a match with, with, a, with a, a lesser classed um, Jewish, Jewish man uh, named Cohen. Law student. Law student who they cut a deal. This is the origin of Roy Cohn. This is the meta origin I'm going to tell it to you right now. Dora couldn't get married. She was going to be an old maid. The family panicked. They found a young, poor law student named Al Cohn. And they said, if you marry Dora, we'll make you a judge. And it happened. And they made him, they got Governor Lehman to appoint him to a judgeship. He was apparently a very good judge, actually. Uh, and a decent guy, machine, kind of like a machine politician judge. And uh, if you believe Ann Royfe, the cousin, the uh, evil seed of this, un, uh, lo of this loveless marriage produced uh, one of the great evils of our society, Roy Cohn. Um, and I think Ann's uh, has a lot of credibility there. Now, Dora brought Jewish mothering to, I think, new lows, actually. <laughs> need to work on undoing that stereotype as well. Um, <laughs> I want to go back to something you said, since we're in the Jewish, a Jewish context here. Um, you said something about that after the war, Jews were allowed to kind of float up to the highest levels. W did you say after the war? Oh, well, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, in, New York, in New York, the New York social firmament, uh, everything was keeping you down if you were a Jew b before the war, certainly. Uh, there were certain very limited exceptions, like Bernard Baruch. But, you know, there's a great letter, it's a horrible letter, actually, from my hero, Eleanor Roosevelt, where she writes to her mother-in-law, Sarah, um, that after she goes to the, the Baruch's house for the Jew party, uh, she never wanted to hear about furs or money again. Now, this was Eleanor, a different Eleanor Roosevelt than we know. This was the um, pre-Depression uh, uh, young Eleanor, but you can see even someone as brilliant and enlightened, uh, she was a product of her class and she looked down on the Baruchs. That that's the snapshot of what the uh, WASP establishment thought of Jewish people. Roy Cohn um, 
manages to parlay the two most significant paranoid political um, uh, events of the uh, Truman era right after the Second World War uh, and the kind of reconstruction of that period and then the boom of the 50s, the Rosenberg case, he gets right in there as a 23-year-old uh, and then the McCarthy uh, hearing, and the, the ringmaster of that that enabled him was J. Edgar Hoover. So basically, if you think that everything is connected, that is evil and dark about American society, this movie will prove that to you if it was a lurking suspicion. Beautiful. Um, isn't he a great historian? Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I have one final question, just and then we'll open it up, but I... You, all of your films, from from Scotty to Studio Fifty Four to uh, to to Citizen Jane to um, to Valentino, are so archive heavy. Um, how do you how do you work with archive? How do you how does it work? What is the process? What is the artistic process? Let's talk about creative. Uh, I love watching the archival. I think that's the key to it, probably, is that I'll sit there and watch it all. And I have a perverse obsession with the golden age of American broadcast journalism. Uh, probably from being a baby during Watergate, I was sort of, Chet Huntley's voice was kind of, I heard it in the womb or something like that. And it, I have this kind of um, obsession with it. So I, anything I'll watch, a whole year of NBC Nightly News, you know, and then you find the stuff, really. You find, if you watch the outtakes of the unaired NBC News interview, which was shot on film, which means something because it looks incredible and you know it's going to look great on screen, uh, the curation of that for me is uh, heaven. I, I love it. And uh, so I really watch almost everything, and then we pick it, and then we fight because uh, the one thing that's sick, uh, there's a, maybe we can work on this together. There's a sickness in the, uh, the uh, filmmaking world right now, and it's that uh, independent filmmakers uh, are charged the same prices for archival that studios are. So Warner Brothers gets quoted the same price as this movie. So when you want Walter Cronkite for 30 seconds, not even, for 15 seconds, it's $100,000. Uh, and guess who owns a lot of this film? Uh, Getty Images, which is owned by Bill Gates. So we can get to him, Mr. Gates. Uh, if you're listening, lower your prices. Uh, you don't need the money. Uh, anyway, that's how we go about it, and then we work really hard on it. And my point about the, making the joke about Bill Gates, which I'm serious about, is that. Uh, you have to fight to license this stuff and fair use it, which is a, a complicated doctrine that allows people to get out of paying for it. Uh, if you're a, a filmmaker, um, which is a, a lifesaver, you wouldn't be able to see these films or they would look terrible if it weren't for the fair use uh, doctrine. And it, it, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours go into that, just that part alone. Right, right. Maybe the International Documentary Association, on which I serve the, on the board, Right. Can work on that. Why don't we make a little inside Roy Cohn like uh, deal with them? Let's right. do a deal. Good. <laughs> okay, good. Um, you know, it's so interesting. So many of the films in the festival this year, and I want to, I just want to, are talking to this film, and, and this film's talking to them. We have a film about Mike Wallace called Mike Wallace Was Here, and there's an extraordinary interview with Mike Wallace and Roy Cohn in, the, in your film. Of course, the film on Steve Bannon, um, The Brink, which will premiere on Wednesday, next Wednesday, um, is speaking directly to this film. And I think, I, th I, I feel like I also understood Bannon so much better um, having watched your film and thought about your film a lot. Um, so there, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of films about the rise of the right, so I encourage everyone to kind of look at the offerings. Now, let me open it up to anyone here who wants to make comments or thought, offer thoughts or or pose questions. Yes. Hold on. There's a there's a mic coming your way. Great. I think there's still a shock factor. It, it, it makes more sense now, the Trump presidency and how he followed this Roy Cohen philosophy, but it still seems that there was a perfect storm and there's some also external reasons why he was still able to become president. Can you speak about that a little bit and your feelings? Uh, yes, of course. Um, 
the, uh, the markers for the Trump presidency were there, uh, visible beneath the surface, and this film uses Roy Cohn as a decoder ring or a Rosetta Stone, really, to help you understand that. I really do think uh, it lies overwhelmingly with Cohn and a cohort of people who used uh, crypto-fascist or just blatantly fascist bully tactics uh, and demagogic tactics that are tried and true and were uh, retooled uh, at the end of the Second World War uh, to turn um, the national security state and fear of communism into a political cudgel. However, at the time, Harry Truman and, and the Republicans, which eventually were personified by Eisenhower, were equally guilty of this. Nixon then, I think, took it over, and Roy Cohn and J. Edgar Hoover and Nixon are all cut from the same cloth. So it has its origins then. We're having a, um, we're having a resurgence of it. Uh, in the person of Trump. There's an incredible moment in the film where an uncredited voice comes on screen over a montage that we created. And uh, this a voice talks about McCarthyism. And it, it says, McCarthyism, I'm not talking about the senator from Wisconsin. Uh, he's just a name and a symbol. I'm talking about the rise of the demagogue and the um, passion for untruth and the willing to say anything and the big lie just to uh, attain victory. That's a paraphrase of someone who happens to have been Harry Truman, who gave an anti-McCarthy speech, uh, perhaps as a mea culpa for helping to enable this for his own political success, which is another story. Uh, that's a big part of our history. But Roy Cohen knew all this. He was right there. And J. Edgar Hoover is kind of like the wild card. He's sort of the joker in this, um, this horrible um, uh, quasi-fascist strain that runs through our politics that we thought had uh, gone um, far beneath the surface. But we can see how easily it can surface. Other, other folks. Way in yes. The yes. Is that David? Yeah, yeah. Hi. Uh, hi. Hold on. There's a mic coming to you. So Matt, what if the liberals? He has a loud voice. It's great. Uh, well, I used to make a non-living with my voice. I know. Um, <laughs> so one of the liberals whom Roy was close to was Cy Newhouse. Yes. And one magazine that could have done, let's say, multiple stories, whom Roy was a perfect character for was Vanity Fair. Do you think that size closeness to Roy kept that whole umbrella of new house publications from, from getting under Roy a bit more than it, they uh, did? Indisputably. Uh, the, the, he had, Roy Cohn went to uh, school at Horace Mann, uh, a bastion of New York liberalism, actually, uh, with uh, Cy Newhouse. They were classmates at Horace Mann. And there was another strange coincidence that uh, Generoso Pope's son was another person in this class. So you have Roy, who became the uh, dark prince of media manipulation, uh, being uh, best friends with Sai, who was the very unsure, very kind of uh, um, uh, shy and uh, um, bashful uh, scion of the Newhouse Empire. And then you have uh, the uh, National Enquirer family in there as well. This evolves in a, in a perverse way that in hindsight makes total sense. Roy manipulated his way to sign Newhouse's father, Sam, who controlled the empire for another 20 years after the 1940s. And he made himself, Roy Cohn made himself sign Newhouse's keeper and, and sort of chaperone. And when Cy would get into trouble, Sam would call Roy and say, get Roy out of trouble. Roy Cohn and Cy Newhouse talked reportedly four to five times a day. And there was never a bad word about Cy, about Roy in, in these publications. Now, bringing it further, uh, Cy Newhouse owned Random House. Roy Cohn's books were all published by Random House. Uh, Roy Cohn's books did everything to, um, Burnish Roy's reputation, and Roy used it as his manipulation tool to um, state his own case. Newhouse owned hundreds of newspapers across the country. Roy had full access to that. He also had the Hearsts, too, by the way. He had the Berlin family as well. But then, and this is where it gets creepy and kooky, um, 
because Roy uh, saw I own Random House, he called Peter Kaminsky, the head of Random House, uh, and said, there's this young guy that Roy Cohn's told me about, Donald Trump, why don't you have him in for a meeting, maybe he could write a book. And that was the origin of the art of the deal. Uh, so Cy Newhouse was the midwife for the art of the deal. So it has everything to do with that. And it came from grade school. Uh, it's in the film. Uh, I'm not sure if he did. Uh, we, uh, one of the great things that's a privilege of the film is that it has, uh, for the first time ever seen, uh, Roy Cohn's personal archive in it, uh, his own photographs of himself, which I'm pleased to say are very incriminating on the gay front. Uh, <laughs> we used as much as the, of that as possible. Uh, Yes. Trump is capable of making a statement and then shortly thereafter uh, uh, making a statement uh, for the opposite. But uh, he did say uh, that Cohn was just one of many lawyers he had. And he was not that significant. He didn't pay him that much money. Of course, he wouldn't have paid him even if he had to. Uh, and uh, he uh, really wasn't that important. Is there a counter story here or a parallel story here that the profound influences on Trump were really his father and the hurly burly of the New York State, uh, New York City real estate world? Uh, I've, Trump's influence was not that profound. I've come up with a theory about that that came from making the Studio 54 movie and this movie back to back. I had a realization. Uh, first of all, the, the first part of your question, Trump had other lawyers, yes. I don't think Cohen was a lawyer. He was a consigliere. That's your own line in the film, Jim. Jim Zirin, who's brilliant <laughs> in the film. Uh, he, was, he was, as Jim says in his beautiful cadence, he, he whispered in the ear of the dawn, uh, and he gave advice. He was full of advice. And the dawn is literal and metaphorical here. The dawn, dawn old, uh, and the mafia dawn. And uh, there's a convergence there, of course. Uh, what I realized, having made the studio movie, Studio 54 movie, which is about Ian Schrager and Steve Rubell, and uh, seeing, uh, examining Trump's relationship to Cohen is that Ian Schrager and Donald Trump uh, have no fault of their own, actually, a lot in common. They were both the handsome, eldest children, well, Trump's not the eldest, but they're sort of scion position sons, tall, handsome guys, who the mafia-connected fathers wanted to go into New York society and rise a level above them and also shake off the stink of the mob connection. Who did you go to to achieve that goal? And I think Fred Trump, uh, who had mafia connections, and Ian Schrager's father, who's uh, Louis Schrager, also known as Max the Jew, who was Meyer Lansky's chief associate in New York, both steered their sons to Roy and Roy did his job very well. And he was almost like a, a dry cleaner for the, uh, the Scions. <laughs> and uh, those two guys were dry cleaned by Roy Cohn. But after Cohn got disbarred, didn't Trump dis distance himself from him? Yes, everyone did. Uh, it wasn't alone. It was the AIDS uh, uh, factor as well. Yes. How much did... Uh, Barbara Walters have to do with raising Roy's profile in society in New York? Uh, Barbara Walters, uh, the, the New York media combine and the media industrial complex of which Walters was the personification, uh, melded perfectly with uh, Roy Cohn's agenda. So who does Roy Cohn use as a beard and go around saying he's going to marry and who falls right into it and doesn't push him aside, but Barbara Walters. So they had this incredible dark symbiosis uh, born out of uh, the, everything that's perverted about New York media. And uh, so they were like the, the dark power couple 
of of New York media. Nothing could be sicker than that combination. I think. Um, sorry, Barbara, but that's how I feel. Uh, and you know what? You get to say how you feel. I wanna. We. I think we need to. Oh yes, Gary. <laughs> Gary Marcus from the also from the film. Hi, I I lived with Roy um, for about six months, and he frequently had. Uh, he, w he was very good friends with Barber. She, she would call, this had nothing to do with power politics. It had to do with a deep friendship. And she would frequently call at night and they would spend hours talking about their personal lives. Um, and uh, I mean, there's a lot more to this, but, uh, but I, I just have to say that I really think the relationship was real and I think it was based on a very strong friendship. Do you think it was, uh, he says to Morley Safer, uh, Barbara and I are going to get married when we're 60. <laughs> um, and then Mor Morley Safer's reaction is exactly yours. He guffaws. Uh, yeah, yeah, so. Okay, so, so yeah. what about that? Okay, so, um, <laughs> so when, when Roy was, was younger and when he hadn't really even admitted to himself that he was gay, uh, he and Barbara were kind of fixed up. And his mother, Dora, felt that she was too plebeian for him. That she wasn't. She wasn't sophisticated enough. That she and she at the time she wasn't. So um, he probably would never have married anybody. But he and but he really did seriously think about marrying Barbara. And uh, so the affection was real. Uh, eventually, they went their own ways. When when she used to call Roy, she was married to somebody else. And she would talk about her marriage with, with the other person. But um, I think by the time, I think Roy might have used the relationship publicly as a, as a beard later on. But I do believe in the beginning it was genuine. It was his mother who interfered with his marrying uh, her. And by the way, his mother put the, uh, you know, basically destroyed any relationship he'd have with any woman uh, just because they weren't good enough. And, uh, but I, I think it was a real relationship. And obviously, um, he used it as a beer later on, but it was genuine. I, I talked to another uh, quote unquote girlfriend of Roy Cohn's, uh, Carol Horn, who was a clothing designer uh, at the time. And uh, she seemed to almost have PTSD, not because I don't, I don't think Roy was at all bad to her uh, in, in a traditional way, but I think she felt very used by him in retrospect and thought that uh, she had been um, naive and had felt sad about it. Uh, that was her perspective, at least. Of course, uh, the origin of the relationship with Barbara Walters was Barbara Walters' father, right. Lou Walters, who owned the Latin Quarter, right. and uh, he was arrested, and Roy Cohn got him out on bail, right. and he was so pleased with the outcome right. that they were at a party, I think, in Florida. Fountain Blue Hotel. Yeah, right. before... Yeah. Before Barbara Walters was Barbara Walters, and Lou dragged his daughter over to Roy Cohn and said, here's the man you're going to marry. Right. So I think then after that, she thought maybe uh, they ought to get together about something. This is all so creepy in retrospect, isn't it? <laughs> and just uh, to add in the final missing mosaic tile of this riveting New York sick social history, um, Lou Walters was indicted in Massachusetts and was told by the New York State tax authorities that if he came into New York, he would be arrested. And Barbara Walters was then making her way up at NBC as a young writer. And she ha loathed Roy. She had four or five years of wanting nothing to do with him because of the McCarthy Association. And he kept badgering her to put Lionel trains on, in commercials on the air. And one night after she learned this advice, she was literally in her bathtub sobbing when the phone rang and she picked it up, it was Roy. And she, he said, what's the matter? And she said, my father is being indicted and he will not be allowed, he'll be arrested if he comes into New York State. And Roy said, find me the judge and I'll take care of it. And he did, and he got this wiped off the books according to Barbara's own story. And that is where the loyalty and the friendship really began in the late 50s with this. So again, it's to, to, to Matt's really exquisite point, we have a trifecta of mafia kids with Ian Schrager, with Roy, with Donald, and now with Barbara. We can add Barbara to that, to that trio. 
And well, of course, as, uh, as a final statement, uh, perhaps <laughs> the, the, epi- the, the epilogue Who is, will have the last word? The epilogue is... <laughs> Gary, Gary when, doesn't necessarily when agree. Roy would uh, turn to an associate and ask him to research a question of law, and the associate would come back and say, uh, Roy, the law is against us. And Roy would say, fuck the law, who's the judge? <laughs> and uh, that, was, uh, that was Roy Cohn, and I think that's still the attitude of Donald Trump, so it, it does resonate. All right. We, um, we actually must stop, the although... The premiere of the film. We'll miss the premiere of the film. We have to go to the premiere of the film. I want to thank everyone for, for thank par- you. participating. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Please come see the film.